Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this webinar on online infrastructures of transnational engagement in the Horn of Africa. My name is Naya Kleist. I'm a senior researcher at DEES, and I've been looking a lot forward to this webinar. Today, we have Pete Chunga with us from London. A very warm welcome to you also, Pete, and thanks for joining us. Before I, before I go on to introduce uh, the webinar, I would just uh, like to encourage or invite those of you who feel like it to introduce yourself uh, in the chat. So while we cannot be in the same physical room, uh, it might help give uh, an impression of who else is in the room, which can be nice. So uh, this uh, webinar is the fifth webinar in a series on analytical approaches to infrastructure that I'm organizing with my colleague, uh, Jeff Norman. Here's Jeff. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Naya. Um, thanks, Pete, also for joining us. Um, we're looking forward to today's talk. Uh, so this webinar series explores different analytical and theoretical approaches of infrastructure. And we find this is interesting as infrastructure constitutes social technical system and connection apparatuses. Or as Brian Larkin said in the first uh, webinar that we organized, uh, infrastructures are systems that enable other systems to work. So that could be tra transport systems, it could be electrification, water supply, the internet, or digital communication platforms like we'll talk about uh, today. And we find that analysis of infrastructure uh, can provide highly productive topics of analysis or way of approaching and framing certain issues. And certainly they raise a lot of questions that we have discussed uh, uh, in our webinars and will also discuss today. So these are questions like, how can we understand the durability of infrastructure? What are their temporalities? What do they promise? Who are connected, who are included, uh, or who are excluded? What are the rationalities underpinning them? And what do they enable? And finally, and not least, how do they relate to governance, inequality, inequality and different geopolitical histories? Uh, so, so far we have discussed the ambient infrastructures of generators in Nigeria with Brian Larkin. We have talked about temporalities and the importance of maintenance with Akil Gupta. Uh, we have talked about infrastructure, the legal infrastructures of the global shipping industry with Lala Khalili and rentier capitalism in Kenya and the underpinning payment and debt infrastructures with Kevin Donovan. And today we'll stay in the Horn of Africa, we'll focus on the Somali regions and the very important topic of communication infrastructures and info algorithmic power. And we are so lucky that Pichonka is with us today and he's an absolute uh, expert in this. Uh, so Pete is a lecturer in global digital culture at the Department of Digital Humanities at King College, uh, London where he researches in and teaches various aspects of digital communication with particular focus on Somalia and Somali language media networks. So that is in regard to state construction, the production, dissemination and use of digital text and how the new media environment affects political reconstruction, civil society, activism and conflict in so-called fragile states. And to mention a few of his recent publications uh, is a really uh, excellent overview of ICT and mobility literature in the Horn of Africa, published at SOAS, and he has also written about book fairs and the digital politics of Somali literary promotion, and amongst other uh, publications, an article with the captivating title, The Empire Tweets Back, Hashtag Humanitarian Star Wars. And before Pete became a researcher, he worked in the Horn of Africa, first for the University of Hargeisa in Somaliland, and then as a Somali interpreter for the Red Cross in prison in central Somalia and Puntland. And I remember when Pete and I met for the first time at a conference in Somali conference in Helsinki, and there was this walk around an island and we talked about his work and I was like, whoa, this is impressive. So I'm still impressed and it's really great to have you with us uh, today. Uh, before I hand over the virtual stage uh, to Pete, there are some practical remarks. So even at a webinar, there's practical uh, information. So during the talk and afterwards, please use Q&A Q uh, function to ask questions and you can, yeah both during the talk and afterwards. 
uh, the thumbs up function is on, which means that if somebody asks a question so that you think, wow, I would like to have asked that question uh, myself, or this is really interesting, you can use that and then the question will move up in the order of questions uh, on my screen. Uh, and Pete will talk for around 20 minutes or so, and then afterwards we'll have uh, the discussion, which will go up to uh, the maximum of four o'clock uh, Central European time, Danish time, uh, and the equivalent of wherever you are. So once again, a very warm, warm welcome to you, Pete, and the e floor is yours. Thanks so much, Naya, um, for that very kind introduction, and um, yeah, thank you um, to you and, and Jeffro at DIS for this uh, for this invitation. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. I've got a few slides for you today. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, thanks um, for the invitation. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about online infrastructures of transnational engagement in the Horn of Africa and the Somali. Uh, digital public, and I hope I'm going to give you a, a, a better sense of, of what that actually means in practice as we go through um, the presentation today. And um, the first thing that I would say is that I'm not an infrastructure scholar. Um, I suppose if I do have an academic background, um, it's a background in African media studies. Um, but in recent years, I've been increasingly interested at, at, uh, in thinking about um, digital communications platforms as infrastructure. And I think it's actually quite a, a helpful and productive way to kind of explore flows of, of information and, and information and political dynamics on the ground in the Horn of Africa. And um, I'm going to talk about the Somali Horn of Africa um, today, in particular um, Somalia. And I want to talk a bit about um, the implications of the global ubiquity and pervasiveness of, of primarily Western based um, digital platforms in, you know, ac across large swathes of the of the of the of the wider globe um, and think about various kind of um, tech companies think about actors such as as Google and, and Google's ecosystem of different platforms you know ranging from search to, to YouTube um, thinking about the role of, of, of platforms such as um, Facebook which on the African continent you know Facebook for for so many people is the the internet and the question that I'm interested with 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 my research in, in recent years it has been um, how is this um, ubiquitous digital infrastructure of, of online platforms actually used in contexts that are affected by um, limited state capacity and transnational, and here I'm talking about diaspora engagement and realities of online conflict. Basically, I'm, I'm interested in, in how these platforms hit the ground, how they are used in contexts which are so far removed and so distant from the contexts of their creation. Um, and what I hope to kind of give you some examples of today are potential kind of new roles um, of these platforms in these contexts when they come to be used by different groups of, of people, different groups of actors, political actors, for example. And some un, uh, unanticipated forms of, of what um, Boucher refers to as algorithmic power. Um, and so for the first part of the, the, the talk today, I'm going to talk a little bit about my previous um, research um, on the ways in which political actors have used social media platforms um, to communicate in the, in the Somali context. And in the second part, I want to um, introduce and, and just provide a particular case study of, of what I think um, exemplifies um, algorithmic power. And this relates to the use of the Somali language in the Google search engine and, and, and search engine auto complete um, functions. Um, so just to give you a bit of background and context, um, as I said, I'm interested in the ways in which digital platforms are used in contexts which are highly, very far removed or very distant from the context in which such platforms are developed, like e.g. if we're thinking about Silicon Valley in the, the West Coast United States, for example. Um, and previously, my research has looked at communications dynamics in a context such as Somalia, which is characterized by quite extreme political fragmentation um, and in, in certain areas is um, ongoing and sporadic um, armed conflict. Um, 
not since 1991 and the collapse of the Somali state, there has been no um, nationally recognized um, sovereign authority that has maintained um, control over the whole territory um, of, of Somalia. This is a fairly recent map. This is a good recent map from, from August 2019. The dynamics on the ground today are pretty much the same as this. And this shows you a patchwork of different political territories, um, um, de facto independent but unrecognized Somaliland in the north, um, autonomous um, Puntland um, in the in in the northeast, which is part of the federal. Um, which is a federal member state of Somalia. The Somali federal government um, headquartered in, in Mogadishu, which nominally controls um, um, all of this territory, but struggles really to exert its capacity beyond um, the capital city. Um, a patchwork of newly formed um, federal member states, of which Puntland is one, and there are, there are, there are many others, um, and the continued presence um, of, of Al-Shabaab um, and, its, and its continuing insurgency against the Somali federal government and its international backers um, such as the United States, European states um, and the, the, the African um, Union. And previously my, my research has looked at how um, uh, a state in somewhere like um, state authorities in somewhere like, like Mogadishu, highly weak, highly, um, highly constrained um, in a process of reconstruction and counter-terrorism have used media technologies to communicate to um, various different audiences and attempt to assert their legitimacy. And the image you see on the left hand side of the slide here um, is the former head of um, uh, uh, Somalia's National Intelligence and Security Agency communicating on Somali national television and through Facebook and, and various other social media platforms in the context of that government's fight against um, an al-Shabaab insurgency which continues. Um, and I'm, you know, I've been interested in how um, processes of state reconstruction, which we see ongoing political reconstruction, the, the reconstruction of institutions um, in somewhere in a city, the capital city such as Mogadishu, um, have taken taken place. This is something that I witnessed in my, my work for the for the Red Cross as a as an interpreter, you know, with these kind of interlocutors in, in institutions and seeing how state reconstruction plays out in the age of, of social media in quite a distinct um, um, communications um, environments. Now, you know, since 2016, if we look at the United States of America, you know, we see we see commentary that talks about um, Trump's presidency as being a presidency by by Twitter, and 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 commentary about the ways in which new media platforms can be used by politicians to bypass um, um, institutional dynamics and institutional protocols of of, of um, communication from a state to speak directly to um, to citizens. And, and some of the kind of destabilizing implications um, of this. Um, I look at the Somali case, and particularly since kind of 2015, 2016, and I look at the ways in which, I have looked at the ways in which the Somali federal government um, has used social media platforms such as Facebook very quite intensively um, to communicate with multiple different um, constituencies. Um, and so um, it's a little bit of a, it's a bit of a poor comparison, I suppose, um, in terms of, you know, presidency by Twitter versus governance um, by Facebook. But it raises this question about like, what, how does the new media environment affect institutional protocols for state communication and, uh, and the, the, the extent to which it can um, uh, assert its um, legitimacy um, and how does this change in, 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 in the social media age and this is a fact that is not lost on um, political commentators and concerned citizens in the Somali um, context um, and the image on the right hand side of the screen here um, is, a, is a still from a pop music video by an artist called Ilka Asay uh, Gais um, whose famous song Igu Sawir means take my picture which is a critique of the federal government's extensive use of selfies um, in its kind of um, uh, uh, presentation of um, its discursive legitimacy and um, within the Mogadishu context. I highly recommend YouTubing that song because it's great. Um, now, more seriously, um, this this part of my research has looked at some of the difficulties that the Somali federal government um, has faced in using this communications infrastructure, i.e. a social media communications infrastructure, um, to communicate with its, with its um, population. Um, and this takes place in a very high stakes um, context where counterinsurgency and the international involvement of foreign military forces is a, a regular occurrence and a fact, you know, a fact on the ground um, in Somalia. Um, and in my research, I've looked at particular examples um, 
impact of where communication strategies have broken down quite spectacularly for the, the federal government, in part due to the pervasive use of social media by, by, by government actors. Um, 2017, August, um, uh, it was a particularly um, US special forces raid target targeting um, al-Shabaab in a town called Barire, um, which resulted in um, uh, a large number of civilian um, casualties, as you see in the image of the, the burial on the, on the left-hand side. And my research um, using this case study um, documented the ways in which different um, government um, actors communicated about this highly controversial and, and, and shocking and disturbing um, incident um, in a very contradictory fashion, because politicians are connected to their different constituencies and communicate directly to people through um, Facebook, spreading often very contradictory information about what actually happened in this instance and the investigation procedure that, that, that went along um, accompanying this. And this resulted in directives from the state um, to to politicians to kind of stop to control their social media use to tell people not to go on social media to kind of communicate in this highly kind of febrile and contested um, context um, that hasn't really been followed um, by the way um, since then and these kind of communications um, patterns um, continue so this is kind of one of the first questions that I've been interested in my research around um, how the new media environment and, and infrastructures, kind of ready-made infrastructures of communication are available to political actors and some of the implications these have in a, in a, in a, in a very complicated security um, and contested um, political environment. Now, in recent years, my, uh, well, I suppose the last year or so, um, I've been increasingly interested in sort of switching my, my focus away from the, the actors using the platforms, the, this infrastructure of, of, of communications and, 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 inf and information to the platforms themselves and the way these kind of foreign created, Western created um, information, digital information platforms um, interact in sometimes quite unanticipated ways with um, dynamics in the Somali language um, media environment. And this is when we start to think about algorithmic um, power. Now, a key kind of intervention in debates about the role of algorithms in digital communication and algorithmic power comes from someone like Sophia Umoja Noble, um, who wrote the book Algorithms of Oppression, about the ways in which search engines such as Google um, reinforce um, racism. We are kind of we are used to thinking potentially of something like Google, uh, Google search as sort of a neutral window into what exists out there online. And of course, Google is anything but a neutral window into what is out there online. And um, what we see in search engines and search returns are influenced by all sorts of different kind of commercial um, factors. Um, and a market that commoditize language um, in order for advertisers to you know, target us with personalized um, content. And so it's these, according to Emoja Noble, as she documents, it's these kind of um, commercial underpinnings of something like search that um, can reproduce um, racist tropes in terms of search, um, search uh, term returns and, and autocomplete um, suggestions, um, et cetera. Um, and she, she talks about this in relation to, to race and and the, um, in particular, the kind of experience and representations of black women in, a, in an English language, Western social um, um, online um, environment. Now, for the rest of this presentation, I want to, to think a bit about how this, these dynamics potentially work or interact in a language context that is very different um, from English in a Somali language content, context. So how is it that the use of Somali language search terms, for example, might interact with these algorithms that underpin a communications infrastructure and produce some quite interesting and potentially problematic um, results? And I was sort of inspired to think about this through my own use of Google um, and the Somali language. And when I was doing my PhD fieldwork around um, 2015, um, I spent my, 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 my PhD field work was on online discourse um, about Somali um, politics, and I use Google and, and, and Somali language online sources quite um, extensively. And I noticed, as you can see in the screenshot here, that when you put um, the names of um, politicians, the Somali spelling uh, names of politicians into a Google search engine, 
Google autocomplete drops down and presents you with various quote unquote predictions of what you might be looking for. And some of these predictions um, stood out to me um, quite strongly and they're highlighted in the, uh, in the slides um, here. And um, so Hassan Ali Khaire is the name of the former prime minister of Somalia. And you can see that the two suggestions that I've highlighted, Hassan Ali Khaire al Kabil Kisa, referring to his clan or Kabilka, the clan of this. So it's a prediction that my, me as a user, so someone who's using Somali language, is potentially looking for information about the clan in another African context, we might talk about the ethnic or tribal identity of this um, um, politician. So this kind of got me thinking um, about this and what's the significance of this? What, what, what does this mean? Um, so in order to kind of explain something about this, I need to kind of give you um, a little bit of background about clan as a concept. Um, you know, there's a traditional idea that Somali society um, in, the, in the Horn of Africa um, is characterized by the shared use of Somali language and um, um, unity through sort of universal adherence to, to, to Islam. And yet Somali society is seen as being historically divided into different um, clan groups by, by patri uh, pat patrilineal uh, lineage. This is a highly controversial um, concept um, and clan in historical literature is something that's been seen as fluid. It's, it's, it's not something that it's static. It's shifted through different periods of, of history in its interaction with state politics. Its role is highly disputed um, in histories of, of civil war and conflict in Somalia. Sometimes it's referred to as an invisible difference because in general, um, clan difference is not marked by um, ethno-linguistic difference as ethnic identity is to a greater extent in, in Ethiopia um, or, or Kenya. Um, it's disputed, but it's also highly politically relevant. And in part, it is institutionalized in certain um, um, structures of government in Somalia. For example, the 4.5 system of dividing representation up amongst the, the so-called major clan groups in the Somali um, federal government. So it's a controversial, disputed topic, and it's an important one. And, and the cartoon from Amin Amir, Duxi Malak, uh, um, is, a, is a poetic quote from a post-independence era poet, Sudan uh, Tim Ade, um, who talks about, you know, there is there is no sanctuary, there is no goodness in tribalism, clan, um, there is there is only destruction. And this is a kind of a recurring trope in discussion about Somali politics. So what does it mean when these types of keywords pop up in Google um, autocomplete? So I thought that it would be um, a useful experiment to start testing this um, in relation to the names of other um, politicians in the Somali um, context. And the table here shows the, the prevalence of clan related keywords that pop up as predictions um, within um, Google. Testing for the personalization effect of my own online profile and my location I also conducted the test on different computers in the UK, i.e. computers where Somali language had never been used compared to my own, which had been used extensively, and also colleagues in, um, in Somalia. I'm grateful to my friend Mahad Wasuge from Somali Public Agenda for doing this test with me, for me, uh, on his computer um, in Mogadishu. And you can see there's not a lot of difference um, in terms of the results and the types of clan related keywords um, that came back. Um, so what does this mean and what are the implications of this as informational infrastructure? Um, the first thing that we can say about these predictions is that they show that people search for this type of information, right? This algorithm, which generates a prediction, is based on the data that users have put in. So we know that some people have, have, have used um, Google to search for these types of keywords about individuals. But I would suggest it's actually um, a lot more complicated um, than that, because within this type of um, phenomenon, we might actually see what I would refer to as a recursive feedback loop and the ways in which one search can lead to others. Now, Google describes the autocomplete predictions as predictions and not suggestions. 
Now, I would say that that boundary is highly blurred because when we see something presented to us as an opportunity um, to, to search for something, it may encourage us to click on that search term um, in a way that we weren't necessarily expecting um, to do when we initiated um, the search. Um, and imagine you know you can do a thought experiment and you think about someone who's putting a name in um, to a search engine without thinking about a particular identity of clan identity of someone seeing that option and then clicking on that option to search for that when that choice is made that becomes data in of itself which feeds back into the algorithm which makes it more likely that that particular suggestion is going to appear again so this is where we get this kind of recursive feedback loop um, and 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 what point does a prediction become a suggestion just to make this clear when i was doing the tests and when my colleagues were doing the tests we never clicked through on any of these search terms we only recorded what autocomplete um, showed us because we did not want to feed into the pattern of generating the data that makes it more likely that, that similar people will come up with these um, predictions. So this is an example of algorithmic power, pre presenting people with particular options to search for information that maybe they weren't necessarily thinking about um, before. What else does this tell us? Well, we should also think here about the transnational um, dynamics that are potentially at play here, partly between the, the platform and the algorithm, which is designed and managed somewhere else, and what's actually going on in the Somali Horn of Africa, but then also about the potential role of transnational Somali language users. We know that the results are showing that um, people are using these types of search terms, but and we know that they are we we know that they are Somali speakers, and thus they are likely to be Somalis. You know, excluding the few kind of researchers like myself who are <laughs> non-Somali researchers who are using Somali language key terms. Most people we assume are Somali language speakers, and thus Somalis. What we don't know is where these people are. And we might assume that there is a greater use of Google um, in diaspora context as opposed to the Horn of Africa. Now, because the results that we see um, in, the, um, in the test being done in Somalia show very little difference in the results, we can potentially see the way in which the behavior of digital Somali language users in the diaspora feeds back into the information environment on the ground for online users in, in Somalia. We can think about this in terms of a factor in identity construction, um, you know, contrasting primordialist, instrumentalist, constructivist um, uh, discussions and debates about identity formation, and think about the ways in which um, these, ty this, these types of algorithmic power um, influence those identities. And we should also think about the role of search engines as de facto historical archives. Um, and the potential for people to search for historical information about clan politics, for example, and how this feeds into these kind of recursive processes of, of the pre presentation of particular forms of identity, manifestations of particular um, types of algorithmic power. Um, so just to kind of conclude here, um, what we see across the tests is um, that there is less personalization um, of autocomplete predictions in the Somali language. Um, if you are using Google in English language context um, in somewhere like the UK or, or Denmark, um, the, the, the returns that you get in terms of your search results and autocomplete are likely to be influenced by a certain degree of personalization based on your location, based on your, your browser history, what the algorithm thinks you want to look for or buy. Um, we don't see that with, with, with Somali. And that's potentially a result of a, a, a lesser degree of commercial surveillance of Somali language digital input into these communication um, infrastructures. Um, because the algorithms are not harvesting so much Somali language data in the way that they harvest um, English language data, this can explain this, 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 um, this, this lower degree of, of, of personalization. So in one sense, that's kind of a freedom from the types of um, algorithmic power that scholars like Shoshana Zuboff talk about in their thesis about, you know, um, surveillance um, capitalism or, or data colonialism, et cetera. But on the flip side, because there is less personalization, it maybe means that there is a wider scope or impact of algorithmic power because the particular um, inputs of certain users in certain parts of the world then tend to 
then have the potential to be broadcast across far larger ranges of audiences in the diaspora, in the Horn of Africa, um, et cetera. Um, and all of this raises huge questions about the accountability of the companies um, who um, maintain these platforms and maintain this infrastructure um, to potentially to moderate these types of um, predictions, their ability to do so, their inclination to do so. And as a non-Somali, it is not my place to say, you know, this is problematic, this should be um, removed. It's my role simply to kind of raise this as something that is happening and something that I would argue needs to be debated in contexts such as Somalia, um, where algorithmic power clearly is manifest in certain digital practices as exemplified by the case study that I, I presented. Um, I also did tests with um, certain gendered keywords as well, which I'd be happy to talk about in the, in the Q&A. Um, but I think my time is up, so I will, I will wrap it up there. Um, thanks um, so much for your um, um, attention, and I really look forward to comments and questions. Um, and my contact details are, are here. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Pete. That was really, really interesting and fascinating. And there are so many things to discuss. And this thing about autocomplete is really, uh, yeah, I think a very, very important uh, issue in terms of uh, what we search on. Uh, so I would like to start off uh, with a few questions uh, myself. So one thing that I was uh, wondering about is that you mentioned Facebook. Uh, and its role, its important role in governance uh, in the Somali context. So a question is, why do you think uh, that is this particular medium? And also I'm thinking about uh, what aspects of it. Uh, so, I mean, there's been a lot of writing about the role of uh, oral uh, communication in Somali uh, culture. So with Facebook and other social media, is it like the written, the visual, the oral aspects, which are, uh, which are more uh, prominent, uh, do you think? Uh, so that's uh, one question. Uh, another question that came to mind is if you ever did uh, a comparison with the English autocomplete in terms of the same, like say you, you wrote the uh, the name of the same politician with the, its English spelling, if the same kind of suggestions uh, would come up, I think that could also uh, be really interesting uh, to know more about. So I'll uh, uh, stop here and then we can uh, go on. But uh, if you would like to start with these uh, uh, questions, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Naya. Okay. So, um, Facebook, why why Facebook? Well, I mean, the Somali context um, is quite similar to um, other African contexts in the, the predominance um, and pervasiveness of, of, of Facebook as a, as, a, as a platform. I mean, Facebook, you know, we think about Facebook as being the kind of the first um, Western social media platform that became globally dominant, pretty much everywhere in the world with the exception of, of China, um, the, you know, the Great Firewall, um, etc. And, you know, Somalis, like many other users, both Somalis in the diaspora and with increasing internet penetration and particularly mobile internet in the Somali Horn of Africa, um, you know, um, were um, uh, um, took up uh, took up Facebook and went on Facebook, you know, um, um, very, very quickly. And, you know, you you, you, you yourself, you know, study um, connections in the diaspora and, you know, these intimate long distance um, um, networks of, of, of people from the Horn of Africa into the diaspora across diaspora contexts. So the, the various kind of affordances of, of Facebook as a platform, you know, lent themselves, you know, so well to that kind of, you know, um, diaspora setup uh, as, as it does in, in so many other kind of diaspora contexts um, as well. So, so Somalia is not particularly different in that context. What's interesting when you look at um, African um, settings um, is the way in which um, particularly younger generations coming online through mobile internet, um, the way in which their first access to the internet has been through a platform like Facebook. And that's why I said at the beginning, in many contexts, like the internet for, for many sort of generations of young African internet users, the internet, Facebook is the internet. Um, and this is something that Facebook has tried to capitalize on in terms of its promotion of, of schemes like free basics um, um, in other contexts in, in the Horn of Africa. Um, 
allowing free um, access to a platform like Facebook um, through um, data plans um, in collaboration with mobile phone um, companies. That was some, and and that has been highly controversial because it kind of it, it cements the dominance of Facebook as this platform, and it creates Facebook as the gateway for people and a gatekeeper um, to the the wider um, internet. And you know, questions about all the data that it's it's collecting. Although what we don't know, as I said in the presentation, is about the extent to which Somali language data is really being harvested or how that is being um, used. Um, the different aspects of um, the different aspects of, of, of Facebook as a platform. I mean, the, the versatility of, of Facebook as a platform in terms of, you know, um, its ability, you know, to people's ability to use it to kind of share, um, to share videos and, you know, oral um, audio video, audio video content um, is, is highly important, you know, in the context of uh, an, an oral um, culture. Um, but, Obviously, you know, um, Somali is a very active um, written um, written text users um, of um, of the platform as well, and that's something I've been interested in looking at in terms of people's engagement with like news stories, for example, that are published on a platform like Facebook, and then how people in in their written engagements with those in through comments. Um, you know, um, talk about those stories, how they how they describe who they are and where they are, how that kind of ties together a Somali um, digital public. So there's many different aspects that you know, and that's not particularly different from anywhere else um, in the world. Um, on your question about comparing with the English, yeah. So um, uh, I, I put you know I put um, names of uh, politicians um, in um, English um, and and did some kind of um, non systematic comparisons, and the clan related keywords did not come up in those um, in those in those in those comparisons. Um, it's interesting. I'll I'll I'll, sh I'll share my screen again, and I'll go back to the I'll go back to the slide. Um, if you look, um, so, um, if you look at the name of the, um, uh, if you look at the name, so Farmajo, so the 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 name of the Somali Somali president. Um, um, you can see that most of the uh, the suggestions that come back are in English as opposed to in um, Somali, which is indicative of well, this is indicative of the fact that Farmajo, is a, which is a nickname, um, which is what you would use to search for the, the Somali president, that's spelt the same in English and Somali. So therefore, the returns that you get for a search term like Farmajo are going to include um, English because he's a high profile, he's, he's the president. There's probably more people using English language searches to search for him, and therefore that feeds into the data, meaning that the autocomplete suggestions are more likely to be in um, uh, in English, whereas the rest, are, um, if you use the Somali spelling, you get them all that come back in, mostly that come back in Somali, some of them are a, a mix. Um, someone, someone like Edna Arden, for example, you can see here, like virtually all of the, um, all of her, the returns for her are in English because she is an internationally renowned figure um, and more people are probably searching for her in the English language than they are in Somali. And um, so there's, this is what this is what makes the test so interesting because you get a sense of like who's doing it and 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 you know that because you use the, the Somali spellings you know that that people are using the Somali language and then that, that they are likely to be Somali and so the mix of languages is, in, is interesting here but yeah there's there's so many more comparisons you could do with this kind of stuff this was just one example that jumped out to me yeah yeah, so interesting. And as you said in your presentation, if you could then have information on where people were searching for, it would be really more, even more interesting, of course, and you run into all kinds of uh, data protection issues. Jethro has a question. Uh, Jethro, please. Yeah, thanks, Pete. That was a, a brilliant, um, a brilliant presentation. Thanks very much for that. Uh, I actually had to, uh, uh, two kind of points. One was uh, sort of jockeying off, off what Naya was saying initially. Um, about about Facebook and, and Somali oral traditions, but but also about print culture, um, because there's also a burgeoning Somali print culture too that coexists alongside and in some ways, I guess, uh, in relation to this digital infrastructure that you, you're kind of talking of. Um, and also like digital platforms, print culture is also uh, kind of a conduit for transnational and diasporic engagement um, as well. So I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about the relationship between, between perhaps print and digital media cultures um, whether they're alternatives to externally governed digital platforms and algorithms of, of oppression and so on, or, or, or in what ways they're kind of interlinked. 
Uh, and the second kind of point was, uh, I was really taken by the methodological implications um, of what you're kind of presenting. So I think it's particularly uh, sort of prescient in this uh, kind of Corona times when we're talking so much about digital ethnographies and digital research methods and so on. Um, but you're really also talking about an awareness of algorithmic power and the implications, for example, of yourself being implicated in these algorithms within the recursive feedback loops and so on. Um, and also the fact that you're inspired by your own experiences of actually using these Somali language online sources and your own dissatisfaction with, uh, with some of that stuff. So I was wondering if you could delve a little deeper into exactly how you go about navigating some of these issues um, when you're researching digital infrastructures and, uh, and also how much do we actually know about these algorithms um, that are built by these Silicon Valley engineers and, and how you're kind of working in the dark when you're, when you're kind of doing that. Um, thanks. Thanks, thanks, Jeffro. Um... So, um, so on the the print culture, um, yeah. So the, the so like um, the way um, print culture. I don't want to use the word developing. Um, the way print culture is kind of changing um, and expanding um, in the in the Somali context is something that I've been really interested in. And, and Naya at the beginning mentioned my, my recent paper that I did on 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 the book fairs um, um, and these as kind of youth events, these really high profile kind of um, um, cultural, also a political aspect to them um, as well, which is sort of exemplifies these you know um, changes and expansions of, of print culture. And actually, in that research, I, I talked a little bit about the ways in which that relates to social media and the written interfaces of social media platforms like, um, like Facebook. Um, so, um, and I was struck by a comment at one of the book fairs a few years ago that I was attending um, uh, by uh, uh, Nadifa Mohammed, who's a British Somali um, um, author, fiction author. She, she writes mostly in, in English and she's a you know, uh, very prominent sort of diasporic literary figure. And she, she was talking um, at, the, at one of the book fairs about the way in which it was her engagement on social media in the Somali language that kind of... Um, raised the profile of written Somali for her um, and I think that's I and like you know if you you, you think about the the media context in in Somalia um, and you know in most places the the lack of a um, a print newspaper culture excluding Hargeisa Hargeisa has a very vibrant you know newspaper scene but most other places you know um, um, much less so. Um, and, you know, Somali intellectuals kind of lament over um, the degradation of the written Somali language and a lack of documentation in Somali and, a, and you know, a decline in the language, etc. And then you contrast that with really vibrant social media spaces where people are using the written Somali language in, in social media platforms to comment on stuff on Facebook, you know, et cetera. Um, you, can, you can see the reality where, you know, so many people have, have engaged with the language, the written language, and um, almost for the first time in some cases through social media platforms. So the relationship between written um, print culture um, and how we see that more formally in things like the book fairs and then how that expresses itself um, through social media and then, my, I mean, my particular paper was looking at the links between those, like how something like the book fair is mediated on social media and how that contributes to political contestation over what this means. Um, that's what I was interested in there. So, so yeah, I, I think those are really important questions and there's a lot more that could be said um, about that. Um, your second question about methods, um, sort of conceptualizing um, algorithmic power, um, yeah, is a, is a challenging um, one because, as you alluded to at the at the end of your question, um, there's so much we don't know about how these platforms um, and how the uh, how the algorithms that underpin this communications infrastructure actually work, and that's what I'm interested in trying to. Um, uncover and doing the kind of tests that I've been doing are a sort of a very sort of tentative first step um, towards doing that to see what pops up and, and document it. Um, I've been involved in the last couple of months doing comparative tests of the same type 
with Amharic keywords in Ethiopian context and Swahili keywords in a Kenyan um, context. And um, the, we, 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 so that's, we've sort of done this exploratory um, study as part of a broader research project um, that, that I'm um, involved in. And we see different dynamics with those um, particular um, languages. Amharic, of course, because of the, the, the presence of the Amharic script, so an entirely different um, script. Um, Kenya is a lot more ambiguous because of the extensive use of, of English. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's lots of challenges in running those kind of tests, but we see interesting things um, pop up. Um, so this is kind of a first step um, towards that, kind of raising these questions about like what, how does algorithmic power manifest itself on the screens of, of users? The next step is then kind of um, raising these and, and debating these kind of things in Somali fora, in Somali contexts, you know, where the users are. And that's part of what I'm involved in now with this other project and raising these um, as, as wider issues. Um, and then also engagement with the tech companies um, themselves. So I, 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 I sort of I, I have something of a relationship with um, Facebook um, in East Africa. Um, very sort of tentatively trying to kind of get more information on um, the ways in which things like content moderation um, are happening um, um, in these in these contexts, um, because we know that a platform like Facebook is under more pressure globally in recent years around issues of content moderation. We know that Facebook has new content moderation um, uh, um, facilities in Nairobi um, with local language speakers, um, you know, from the Horn of Africa, um, but they are dealing with vast amounts of data, right? Um, and the challenges that exist um, and the actual interest that a platform has to do this kind of stuff is, is sometimes um, not always um, clear cut. And these challenges um, are, are huge. And I noticed in the chat, um, um, Ahmed's, um, Put a question in about um, about um, alternative facts and, and and fake news and the implication of social media in in a context like like Somalia um, and this this would relate very much to that and the extent to which Facebook companies have the um, Facebook company <laughs> technology companies have the the implication um, the 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 inclination um, and the actual capacity to to moderate this. Um, this content. And so that's kind of a next step along in the kind of research um, process um, for this. And, you know, I mean, ultimately, I'm kind of um, influenced by the fact that there are so many of these debates going on in, in, in English language, Western um, contexts um, about algorithmic power. And there is just very little um, research interest or existing research on how these things interact with, in, with different languages in very different linguistic, cultural, political contexts, you know, such as Somalia represents. So lots of challenges, but I think this is kind of a fertile ground for, for more investigation. Yeah, uh, definitely uh, a lot more to be done here. So there are some uh, questions uh, from the audience. So a question from Abdifata Ahmed, who writes, considering the effort to move away from the client-based 4.5 system, what do you think the implications are of the algorithmic power on the move towards universal suffrage uh, in Somalia? Yeah, that's that's um, that's a great question. Um, so, OK, efforts to move away from um, 4.5. Well, for the upcoming elections, um, we know that uh, 4.5 has not been moved um, away from. Uh, 4.5 will play a role um, in upcoming um, elections um, uh, in Somalia. Um, and, you know, the last elections were supposed to be the last time this was going to be used in 2016, and they weren't. And, you know, this is this is this thing that everyone hates, but nobody can seem to, to get away from, because what's the alternative? How do you manage it? Um, I think it's really, uh, and this kind of links back to, to what um, Jeffro was asking and what I was saying in my last answer. Um, it's difficult. I can, I can, at this stage of the research, I can document what is popping up on people's screens. I can document instances of algorithmic power. What I am not able to document is the impact of these on the ground in the in the context. Across Africa, more generally, there is very little research on how people use a platform like Google search 
um, in different contexts. Um, Google has, if you, you know, statistics, Google has apparently a 97% market share in, of search engine, you know, um, use on the African continent. And yet we don't really know from the literature that exists about how people like in a city like Mukdishu or in Hargeisa or in Jigjiga or, 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 or Addis or, or wherever, like how people are actually using Google, like how, in what context does autocomplete come up? how do people use search engines in, in African context? Do they use them in the same ways that people use them in Western, you know, um, Anglophone or European um, contexts? We don't know. What we need is um, ethnographic investigation into, you know, everyday digital media use on the ground, including um, search engines. Um, and so, it's through that that you could start to um, you could start to kind of think about the implications of this kind of um, uh, um, algorithmic power um, on on something like debates about 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 4.5. I kind of speculated in the presentation that many of these searches may be coming from the diaspora. You know, we might be thinking about people who are trying to kind of connect with politics back home, maybe who don't have such a great understanding of like the clan dynamics of, of, of elite politics in Mogadishu and thus are using Google like in Denmark or in the UK um, to kind of find information about that. So I, I, I can only speculate because we don't know lo locations. So we need kind of like, um, yeah, everyday um, sort of grounded ethnographic study of um, media, culture, and search engine use in order to get to those questions. But but thanks for that. That's a really important one. Yeah, thank you. So here, there's a research idea from you to everybody here to uh, uh, take up. Uh, so there are more questions relating uh, to this. Uh, so uh, Tabia Shara asks uh, from Germany, she writes, thanks for this great talk. Do different actors use different kind of social media platforms? And also a related, uh, I guess, questions again from Abdi uh, Fata Ahmed, who asked, you know, if discourses in Somalian social media platforms bleed into the algorithms that power these predictions? If so, mm. does the diaspora and local Somalis divide in terms of the uses of platforms like Twitter and Facebook, uh, and if this yeah. has any impacts? Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks, Tabia. Um, yeah, um, and, and Abdi Fatah for these questions. Um, so do different actors use different kinds of social media um, platforms? So um, we've seen that, um, the, the, that Facebook is the dominant platform. And if politicians are communicating with large audience and constituencies, then they use Facebook. Twitter has increased in prevalence um, in the Somali digital public in recent years. Twitter used to be a much more kind of like English language focus, sort of quote unquote elite um, level kind of um, platform, you know, middle classes, um, et cetera, English language speakers. That's changing a bit now. And Google is, is a bit more um, prevalent. Um, Facebook is kind of the platform of the masses. And, and I think politically, it's the most important. The really interesting platform is WhatsApp um, and WhatsApp groups. And WhatsApp groups are really difficult to study because they are private um, and you don't know what's going on in them. Um, but across different African contexts, um, WhatsApp is emerging as like kind of the key platform for um, closed political discourse in large groups, in smaller groups, but hugely important. Um, Colleague, so uh, yeah, Dun uh, Duncan Omanga, a um, uh, scholar working on Kenya, wrote, wrote, wrote a great paper um, on studying WhatsApp groups in the Kenyan um, context. Um, uh, WhatsApp as a digital public, um, looking at closed, and he talks methodologically about how he um, negotiated entrance into uh, a, a WhatsApp group and then um, used the data um, from that. Um, so, so yeah, the question of different platforms is is really important, um, and that's that's yeah, that's that's what I'd be able to say about that for now. But methodologically, I think we need to look at what you can do with something like WhatsApp because my sense is that that's really important. Um, and I think there was the question um, do, from Abdi Fattah, um, do discourses um, diaspora kind of bleed into um, uh, the, the debate? 
I, I think they do. And as I said, I think the, this, the, the, the example that I highlighted in terms of Google search and, and clan keywords, my sense, and this is speculation, is that that is coming from the diaspora. Um, but that is it. I can't prove that. That's an assumption. Um, so and I think there are other examples we might want to look at. Uh, I mean, not just in terms of the algorithms, but in terms of the content and the discourse. Right. There's, there's increasingly people are interested in how digital platforms facilitate diaspora engagement um, from a distance. Um, you know, into contexts on the ground in the Horn of Africa, either for humanitarian purposes, but also for political purposes, purposes relating to the, the conflict. And again, you have to look at what platforms are being used. And again, I think WhatsApp is important here. Okay, thank you so much. So there are two more questions. Um, there is one from Emma Christensen, uh, who asks, uh, Ethiopia is very close to Somalia. Do does SOMI also play a big role in the governance there? And then a question from uh, Lotte Pelkman uh, asked uh, in the chat. Uh, uh, so Lotte writes, uh, are there other groups beyond the government, uh, for instance, Al-Shabaab, um, um, who are also active on the social media and Lotta also writes that uh, she's working on Mali herself, that in Mali when terrorist groups started out, they were much more organized in terms of social media and there was hardly any response by the Malian government, which left a kind of digital vacuum. Uh, so the question is whether mm -hmm. the Somali government is particular media savvy or actually just following through and maybe even lagging behind compared to other groups such as uh, diaspora and et cetera. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, so in relation to Emma's um, question, uh, social media um, and governance in 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 Ethiopia. Um, I mean, Ethiopia is a very different context um, in terms of the the wider kind of telecom um, environment and the uh, and the state monopoly over um, um, over the telecommunications network, which up until now has had the impact of reducing the penetration of mobile um, internets, which is, appears to be lower than Somalia. I mean, the statistics for Somalia are supposed to be quite low as well, um, estimated around kind of 10% of the population, but there's a lot of problems with those statistics. And I would estimate the proportion is actually higher than that given urbanization and the youth of the population um, who tend to be, you know, the, the, the white Wider users. Um, so in the Ethiopian context, um, the, the state is using social media. Facebook is um, an important um, platform and there are lots of discussions um, currently in the context of violence um, um, in Ethiopia in terms of the, the ongoing conflict in, in, in Tigray, um, but also sort of ethnic clashes um, in the southern regions um, about the role of social media platforms in the spreading of um, hate speech and provocative um, uh, content which has fueled violence and the questions about where that's coming from again diaspora influence local circulation but it's becoming yeah I'm not an expert on on on, on Ethiopia but these questions are becoming ever more prominent as um, internet penetration and social media access in Ethiopia is also ex expanding um, extremely um, rapidly um, so yeah um, those are those are those are those are questions that will continue to be um, to be asked um, the other question um, um, about, uh, yeah, so um, uh, militant um, organizations and groups such as um, Al-Shabaab. Yeah, so uh, actually a lot of my, my earliest, um, my first papers on digital culture in the Somali context did focus on um, Al-Shabaab um, as an organization and their use of um, social media, um, like the Malian context, it seems. Um, um, groups like Al-Shabaab were um, around like 2010 onwards um, seem to be much more proficient and savvy with their use of social media than the government um, was. Um, and, you know, Al-Shabaab has long maintained a very 
um, sophisticated network of propaganda channels on different formats, on different platforms across Facebook, across its various affiliated news media sites, um, its use of YouTube, which I've looked at specifically in my research on um, particular sort of document, quote unquote, documentary um, propaganda films that it has um, released. Um, and so it was very effective and it, con it continues to release these kind of um, quite, you know, sort of high quality professional like media products. Um, the, the state's uh, capacity in Somalia to utilize social media has increased quite rapidly in um, recent years. Um, but now, in a context like Mogadishu, a lot of the discussion is about um, the, the, the current government's um, use of social media to kind of attack its critics, its alleged use of bots and, and troll um, accounts to influence um, the discourse. But this has not been leveraged against al-Shabaab. This has been leveraged, allegedly, arguably, against political opponents um, within the context of government. And the Somali state has continued to lack the capacity or the ability to really kind of cut off al-Shabaab's um, uh, channels for, for communication. Um, the state tried to put pressure on telecom communication companies to take down al-Shabaab related websites. The telecom companies in 2016 refused to do so because um, they argued that they could not, that the government could not guarantee their protection if they, if they, if they did that. Um, there's a lot more I could say about, you know, sort of relationships between telecommunications companies, um, the state and the role of Al-Shabaab in these networks. Um, but the bottom line here is that Al-Shabaab still has the community, the capacity to um, communicate to large um, audiences with some quite sophisticated propaganda. Thank you so much. And now time is actually up. This has been incredibly interesting, so much to think about. And I'm looking a lot forward to uh, continue this uh, conversation. So thanks to you, Pete, and thanks to uh, our participants for your great uh, questions and comments. And we hope to see you another time. Have a very wonderful afternoon. Thanks, everyone.